And um, I'm thankful for the people who preserve our lifestyle, our way of living, our veterans. And then if you're not a veteran, you probably know a veteran. And we're going to learn some truth today about what's available in our community. So Garen, Garen has an amazing... His wife, Kim, says he never sleeps at night because he's always working on all these amazing projects that he has going on to, to strengthen our nation, to make our nation better. And if you come up and take a look, there's lots of activities that are going on in here. So Garen was in the Air Force. And you're going to mention about um, Grenada a little bit and your involvement there. And without further ado, hey, that's Garen Cohn, his wife, Kim is right here. That's fine. Thank you, Ron, and thank you, Jerry and Kevin and all you folks for inviting us to come out here and share a little bit with you. I usually begin just like uh, Ron did with a show of hands, how many vets? Okay, now, next test. How many people in this room, okay, some of you aren't vets, how many of you know a vet? See, everybody's got to raise their hand. That's the neat thing about this. AVET Project, just a little background. It's an acronym for American Veterans Empowerment Team. We are a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to providing programs, tangible programs and services to our past and present military members and their families. We are an all-volunteer organization, so nobody's getting a paycheck in this. We're incorporated here in Florida. We have charity registrations here, Oregon, Texas and California, and that's kind of the order of how busy we are. We're most busy here in Florida. We have our largest established base of volunteers, some 320, and second most busy in Oregon, and so on and so forth. The, uh, the thing about this whole endeavor is, as Ron was saying, I'm an Air Force vet myself, served in the 80s. All of you are familiar with our Operation Urgent Fury. I was uh, disabled when I was working on an aircraft at the time that was hot and ready to go to support that you operation. where it was? <clears throat> operation Urgent Fury was in Grenada, for those of you back in 1983-84. Uh, Ronald Reagan thought that we needed to go in there and fix things. And of course, what does America do better than fix things? We're, we're the best at it. So uh, I had an injury based on a... Uh, flight line accident, and I continued to serve until I was boarded out. From there, I went to work for Corporate America, I worked for Hormel Foods, and then I worked for Revlon Cosmetics, and because of my disabilities, I needed to change, change direction. And I thought, you know, I've always had a passion to serve my brothers and sisters, so I became what's called a legal advocate, a non-attorney practitioner for veterans. Started off at the ground floor with the national organization, I uh, went to the University of Colorado, finished up my education there in veterans advocacy, and uh, worked my way up and finally retired about 10 years ago now from the Board of Veterans Appeals in D.C., representing vets before the VA, not on the side of the VA, but on the side of veterans. I've seen just about everything you can imagine from start to finish, people needing help and assistance with their benefits for compensation, pension, health care enrollment, home loan, whatever it might be. If it had anything to do with veterans' benefits, I was involved in it. There's also an entire category in each state of the union. There are state veterans' benefits. And as you peruse this information we put up over here, you'll see some good information that I want you to take away. One of them is the Florida Veterans Handbook. For those of you that aren't aware, there are veterans here, or maybe you're a spouse or dependent of a veteran, even widowers, there are potential benefits that you may not be aware of, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about AVET Project. As I said, we've been in operations since January of 2009, but we all know how the government works. We actually received our certification or IRS determination letter in September of 2009, backdating it to January. So we began in earnest about uh, two and a half, three years ago. Each year we've seen growth, but as the economy has soured, so have donations. And y'all are in here because you have a collective mindset to try and get yourselves employed and help others to get employed. That's kind of the mindset that AVET Project has, not specific to employment, but my wife was working the phone here just a moment ago and came up with a couple positions. I'll mention them right off the bat. There's a, uh, there's a cabinet maker 
in Melbourne, Palm Bay, that's looking for a computer programmer, somebody that can run a CNC machine router. All right, that's that's something. Anytime we come across this stuff, if you're curious and you want to know if we've come across something, because we work with some staffing agencies, Spherion being one of them, we post this stuff on our Facebook page. Another show of hands. Who is comfortable using social media, Facebook and that? All right. Those of you that aren't, because I don't see a lot of people raising your hands. I'm the same way. She's the expert at it. But if you go to avetproject.org, very simple, Alpha Victor Echo Tango Project.org, lower left corner of the page, click on the Facebook icon. You don't have to be a member. You can still view the information that's there. You just can't interact. So at least it'll give you a resource. Uh, another position was a... Um, John Mello is Edward Jones. Edward Jones is looking for a financial advisor, and I've in got Melbourne. This, in Melbourne, and I've got this information here. I wanted to throw that out right now, but let me speak a little bit about because you'll see all this information. Some of our programs and services. We have about seven core programs and services. One of them, which is uh, urgent right now, because we just did a big pack out at Northrop Grumman. We have a care package program. We call them EEBs. Empowerment equipment boxes that we reserve for our frontline combat troops. So those guys and gals that were in Iraq, now in Afghanistan, when they receive these, and they're the standard mailing boxes, the military flat rate boxes, post office just raised the rate from twelve ninety five to thirteen forty five, which really stinks. But and I'll have something else to say about that in a second. These boxes include all the stuff that they want, the hygiene, the things we take for granted that they're not going to get out in the middle of Afghanistan. Well, when they receive these things, it's like Christmas morning to them. It means a lot to them. We include notes from school kids, even uh, Beanie Babies that the kids will collect because they'll stuff a couple in their BDUs as they go out on maneuvers. They see the local kids, you know, hand them a little toy or something. Maybe the dad or mom won't shoot at them later. <laughs> That's what we're looking to do. So if they get this, it's not just, I say it's, a, it's an enhanced care package because we also include information that they can use to... While they're on the battlefield, if something happens, if they have an injury and they're treated by a corpsman, it may not make it into their medical record, but we teach them on how to journal. In other words, the importance. Man, they're young and dumb and you know what, and they're, they're not interested in what's keeping them back. They want to get right back out there with their brothers and sisters. Well, we try and change that a little bit because as they age, those problems, whether it's a broken bone, a twisted knee, a hurt back, are going to resurface. If they make notes of when it happens, who's around, where it happened, just general circumstances, that could help to well ground their claim for disability compensation with the VA. And I'll take a step off and just describe that for a moment. Of those guys that were veterans, anybody getting any compensation from the VA? Okay, very few. And yet a lot of you may be eligible and you don't know it. Somebody may say, well, yeah, but that guy over there needs it worse than I am. He's missing a leg or he, he's... He's worse off than I. I'll let him keep it. No, we can't have, we've got to change that. That's got to be a wholesale sea change in the way we look at it. If every veteran that was eligible applied for their benefits, even though they have a million case backlog right now, they could have easily a two or three million case backlog. And then what's the, what are they going to have to do? Secretary Shinseki is going to have to say, wow, we need to take and retool and figure out how we're going to meet these needs because they're not meeting the needs right now. If everybody that was eligible for any kind of VA benefit applied for same, then they would have to dedicate more resources, and I think it would it would be a good thing. Getting back to the care package, I'll talk about service connection in a moment. Getting back to the care package, how many people in here are aware that as a nonprofit organization, this church being one of them, any of thousands of nonprofits that want to support the troops, we're not. They they can send they can box up all kinds of stuff and send it to the North Africans, the Saudis, the Afghans, the Slovakians, anybody through the Denton program. Back in the Kennedy administration, this is the early 60s, they put together a program called USAID, the Denton program, where if there was space available on taxpayer-funded military transport, they wrote this law in Title 10 of the United States Code, Section 402, that says if we got space available, bring it to us, We'll handle the logistics, get it delivered to these needy people, and you don't have a thing to worry about. Don't have to pay freight or the postage. The exclusion, the prohibition, is you cannot use this to send to our troops. Now, how ludicrous is that? Taxpayer-funded military transports for care packages 
to people you'll never know that have nothing to do with this country, but were prohibited from sending to our troops. That's been an initiative I began over a year and a half ago. It was put together in a formalized letter to several congressmen, Posey being one of them, nothing has happened. I would encourage each and every one of you, if you do nothing else today, check out the website, avetproject.org, you'll find information on this, and make a quick phone call or shoot an email to your congressman or your or senator, Rubio. Last November, I met with uh, Congressman Posey up in D.C., along with Congressman Alan West, briefly discussed this, and uh, Senator Rubio knew a contention of us happened to be with the Rolling Thunder Group. We're members of Patriot Guard Riders, American Legion Riders, Rolling Thunder, all these different groups. We went up there, made appointments to see each of these individuals. The only one that didn't show up was Senator Rubio, even though he knew we were on the docket. And 17 is a pretty good showing for folks coming here, constituents come. You want to pay attention to him. He didn't make it, and nothing has happened with the initiative that I put before his office. Hopefully, Rob Medina, anybody in here familiar with him? He's the veteran's liaison for Congressman Posey. He's picking the ball back up and hopefully going to run with it because that's something that's got to be changed. That will allow all these groups that want to help the combat warriors send stuff over there because that's the biggest holdback for groups like ours is the freight, the shipping. We can get collections. The community is very, very generous. When it comes to money, help. Who's got money? I know we don't. You know, So that can make a big change, and that's something I wanted to encourage you all to do. Another opportunity we have for returning combat vets is our PRNR, Project Recuperation and Reintegration Retreats. These are three-day, two-night retreats. We hold them both in Oregon and here in Florida. We just did our first female warrior retreat last year. Yay! <laughs> Can't forget there's women out there. Eight percent of our active force right now, eight to twelve percent, depending on how, how you fudge the numbers, are women. And a lot of these gals are in theater over there. Quick uh, anecdote. I was having an interview, and I'll get to this American Warrior Radio, with Major General Jeff Buchanan, who was the spokesman for U.S. forces over in Iraq last November as they were completing the drawdown. And I asked him, I said, well, how's the, how's the morale of the troops there on the front lines? He said, Garen, and man, this dude spoke like water. I mean, he was fluid. I mean, we've got some really impressive folks on the high end of our, throughout our military, but I'm, I'm really impressed with some of these guys. And he, said, he stopped me right there and he said, look, when you're over here, you are on the front lines. You got, a, you got a bullseye on your back. So no matter where they are in theater, even if they're in the DMZ in Korea, you know, they're not safe. All right, we're not safe here on our homeland. Anybody remember Fort Hood? Okay, that was one of our own, supposedly. So forget the whole front line notion. If they're in uniform, they're in danger. And of course, consequently, so is their family. And that's something that we really encourage folks to do is support the family members as well, because they're sacrificing just as much as the warriors, especially when you consider these multiple combat deployments. Never before in our country's history have we asked more than one combat deployment from our warriors? Now it is commonplace. It is expected. If you don't, if you don't answer the call, you're leaving. You're out. And we're not talking one or two anymore. We're talking three, four, five, as many as nine. I've heard eleven. The one seal that finally got capped, sixteen combat deployments. Okay, on his sixteenth deployment, he was killed. It's insane. So PRNR is a real important program because. It gives them an opportunity to decompress, relax, get fed like kings and queens. We give them a massage. We give them a recreational opportunity. And uh, we counsel them, and we even screen them for PTSD, TBI. You've heard of the, uh, the biggest wound that's happening. And right as we speak, the county veteran service officers in Florida, almost said Oregon, in Florida, there's 67 counties here. They're very well represented. These are credentialed folks that receive regular and routine training on changes in the law, and what have you. They're holding their biannual conference in Cocoa Beach, getting re-educated, recertified. So, and I want to mention right now that if you have any issues, and because I'm I no longer actively represent anybody, even though I maintain my credentials with the VA, the county veteran service officers are an excellent resource, and it doesn't cost you. The taxpayer, we're already paying for those fees. So you can go in there and find out information and file for claims and benefits. But they're getting trained right now, and it's important because as, as the law changes, we got to keep up with it. We got to make sure that everybody out here is uh, well informed. That's again part of our mission is just trying to get the information out there. 
during the PRNR that I discussed, the Project Recuperation and Reintegration Retreats, we fill their heads full of information about their potential VA benefits, anything from compensation to pension to health care enrollment, home loan guarantee, insurance, all the whole gamut. We really condense it and keep it interesting. And at the end of this retreat, the biggest problem we have, and it's a big problem, is getting them to leave. They don't want to leave. Uh, I will say that at the end of it, we provide them an individualized action plan so that they have literally a template that they can follow to try and overcome some of the roadblocks. And, you know, it's not easy to reintegrate, especially after you've been a soldier, sailor, airman, or marine, coast guard, reserve, or national guardsman for this country, and you've served several tours. You've got a certain mindset, and the last thing they want to do is deal with paperwork and more crap. They just want to leave and get on with their lives. It's, it's not easy. As you all know, the economy out there is a real bummer. And I don't see it really improving much in the near future. When our warriors come back, anybody, anybody out there know how many, what the percentage is of our deployed forces that are in the Guard and Reserves? It'll shock you. Over 40% of our deployed forces are what we used to call weekend warriors, citizen warriors. These are guys and gals that expect, when they signed up, they didn't want to go active duty. They signed up for one weekend a month, two weeks a year, and yet, they're federalized the moment they do now. And this is the way the DOD is handling their manning crisis. They're wringing out our National Guard and Reserves. <laughs> These people, to a man or woman, will tell you, they're not equipped to do this. They don't know the equipment they're working on. Half of them get to qualify on their weapons once a year. And yet, if they don't pass, boom, they're out. It's a tragedy, and yet nobody talks about it. When you've got four out of ten of our soldiers out there on the front lines being citizen warriors that left their jobs and their families, not because of a hurricane where they go help and go back home, you know, and their employer was happy to let that happen. No, they come back, and I don't care how many laws are on the books. The, the Sailor Civil Relief Act, you've all heard about that, promising your job will be here. I don't care. It doesn't happen. When we hold these retreats, we hear time after time after time that they come back and they don't have their jobs. So as difficult as it is for the general citizenry to get substantial gainful employment right now, our warriors are really up against the wall. Some, what is it, 18 to 25 percent of them Suicide. have gone way, I mean, we're talking unemployment rates that are twice what the general population is. For our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines, that's an, that's an important aspect of PRNR. We have a bunch of other programs. Uh, and again, they're listed on that one over there by the coffee pot. You can just kind of breeze through it. And we have ancillary programs, such as going to the military bases, particularly out of Patrick. Every fourth Tuesday, we host a dinner for families of the deployed. Let them know that they're loved. We provide them movie tickets, zoo passes, food, toys. Month of the military child was last month. I wasn't able to make it. Kim drug out, I don't know, a suburban full of toys, kind of a little early Christmas for the kids. We do that just to let them know that we support them. Uh, some of the upcoming things. So we just hosted a <coughs> breakfast for the 715th MP company. The generosity of WMEL Radio paid for the breakfast, thankfully, because resources are tight everywhere. We were able to feed 200 of these warriors, again, National Guardsmen. Just got back a year ago, January. They're going again in October, Afghanistan. And uh, the unemployment rate is bad there, and I'll, I'll get to a little nugget of goodness in a moment. But we fed them breakfast, and the guys are coming up saying, well, what do I, what do I have to pay? No, no, no. Anything AVET Project does is at no cost to the warrior or their family member. We just don't believe in that. They've already paid the price. Um, as, as I say that, I wanted to mention, you see this guy right here? Encourage everybody to listen to American Warrior Radio. Isn't he beautiful? Uh, American Warrior Radio is our AM radio outreach. Throughout the country, there are three programs on terrestrial radio, not internet, but real radio, that address military and veterans issues. We're one of them, and we're happy to be here right in Cocoa. 1300 WMEL on the AM dial. Dial it up online, 1300WMEL.com. We archive past episodes. Just click on the archive tab. You can see past things that you might be interested in, kind of filter through it. But again, my co-host, Glenn McGuffey, happens to be the supervisor at the Brevard County <laughs> Veterans Service Office, right there in Vieira, in Bravo Building, as you're going out to the VA. Can't miss it, just look for the big B, 
hop in there, see him. He's got two fellows that are a little green, but they're getting there. He needs more staff, too. And the county, keep in mind, his office actually generates dollars, federal dollars, coming into the community. Kim, how many vets approximately are in Brevard County? 74,000, not including our snowbirds. So 74,000 full-time folks here are veterans. You take that by multiple of two for all the dependents. You can see there, this is a very rich population of people that are patriotic and have served this country, and it's important that we meet their needs. Glenn's office does just that. If you have any question after this or you have some idea that maybe you could file a claim for benefits, which I'll talk about in a moment, Glenn's office is the place to go. The VA is really trying hard to push everybody onto the electronic filing system. Oh, file your claim online. Not recommended. Not because the form isn't easy enough to fill out. Sure it is. But do you have the basic understanding of what a well-grounded claim is? So I'm going to jump in for just a moment. For all you folks out there that are veterans that haven't filed a claim for VA benefits, let me just cover this real quick. To well-ground a claim for service-connected disability compensation, you have to have, it's a three-pronged approach. Something had to happen while you were on active duty. Not active duty for training, but on active duty. And it has to be of a chronic nature. I'll use the example of a broken bone. Even something so simple as you're up on your house painting it, and you fall off the ladder and break your leg. You wouldn't think that would be a, a service-connected disability. As long as you weren't drunk while you were painting it, which would be considered multi, uh, willful misconduct, that's a service-connectable condition. It may heal, perfectly so, and x-ray evidence shows that it happened, though. So whether you did four years or 20, when you got out and you look back through your record, and, yeah, I broke my leg back in when I was painting the house. As long as the line of duty determination didn't find willful misconduct, you have at least, at a minimum, a 0% service-connected disability. Well, what does that mean? 0%? That doesn't do anything for me. Of course it does. It gives you veterans preference points on government hiring. It opens the door to a whole range of other benefits that I'm not going to go into. But by virtue of becoming service-connected, uh, I'll mention another one, Service Disabled Veterans Business Enterprise. Every state labels it differently, but the idea is they're certifying that you are a veteran that has a service-connected disability, therefore you're given some preference. There are set-asides through the federal government and state governments of anywhere from 1% to 3%, where if they have a contract for computers or paper or whatever it might be, they have to try and fill that first looking to service-disabled veterans that have businesses. So that's an important point, just for 0%. Just that broken bone, even though it doesn't bother you anymore. Let's say another thing happens. Let's say you got diagnosed with hypertension while you were on service, okay, and you've got medication and you continue to have it. So something happened in service. You came down with hypertension. Is it bothering you now? Are you still taking the medication? Yes. Is there a logical connection or nexus between the two? Of course there is. You've met the criteria for a well-grounded claim before the VA. Submit the claim. Get into Glenn's office. It's a simple, informal process where you say, hey, this is me, this is my social, uh, may have a different file number, but the idea is you're claiming it, say, I, I would like to be service-connected for hypertension. The VA will order a confirming exam, a CMP exam, get you in for that, and then I'm not even going to guess how many months later, but you're going to get an award letter from the VA. Those are certain things. For all you Vietnam vets, there's a whole list. They're, they're ugly diseases, but there's some 15 disorders that are called presumptives. That means if you had boots on the ground in Vietnam, and I'll just go off on a tangent here. Shinseki, our new Secretary of Veterans Affairs, as many things as can be said bad about the VA, I will say I'll give him credit where it's due. He's opened the door for a presumptive for our modern day soldiers regarding environmental toxins because the Iraqis and the Afghans, if something is combustible out there, they're going to light it, whether they're using it for fire or wood or cooking or whatever. And our guys and gals are having to breathe this stuff, and they're developing eye problems, respiratory conditions, skin rashes that aren't going away. So this guy, to his credit, has opened that up already. Think about Vietnam. They're still adding to that list of presumptives. This is 40 years later, and they haven't even begun to get all the list or include all the folks. There's brown water vets now, if you were going navigating the channels, protecting our guys on the shores. But if you had boots on the ground and you come down with anything from 
ischemic heart disease, which is anything other than hypertension or valvular, okay, I any heart disorder, that's the new one. To Parkinson's disease, a big common ailment among the Vietnam era vets is prostate cancer. I mean, the numbers go through the roof if you had boots on the ground. These are called presumptives because if you had boots on the ground and you come back down with this disorder, you're going to get service-connected disability compensation. It's a, and it's considerable. Okay, it's a considerable amount of money. Just 10% on uh, just a, another level here, just 10% is going to yield you $120-some dollars a month tax-free for the rest of your life. And it in gradations up to 100% from there. And it even goes beyond if you're really catastrophically disabled. So I encourage anybody that had something happen to them in service, low back pain, maybe you were a paratrooper and you jumped and you hurt your back and you were seen by a medic and it's in your medical record, but you never sought any VA help. Now is the time. I don't care how many years have passed <coughs> since the event, as long as it's provable that it happened in service and it's bothering you now, they will help you to develop that nexus, that causation, by offering a medical opinion. Doctor saying, yeah, he had it then, he's got it now. It's very low legal threshold, at least as likely as not, at least as likely as not related. Boom, that well grounds your claim. The VA determines uh, disability percentage based on the report they get from the doctor. Think of it like this. In the civilian workforce, we have workers' comp. Something happens to you on the job, you're going to be compensated for it. In the military, you're 24, 7, 365, and you're going to be called up at any hour of the day or night and go. So you don't have that. That's kind of what this does. It makes up for that, this service-connected disability compensation. Pension, I'll mention that real quick. For the older folks, if you're over age 65, there are no medical qualifiers. It's all income-based. You had to have had one day of service during a period of war, you have to have active service. I won't go into any more than that. Just remember, if you know somebody over the age of 65 and they had one day of wartime service and they're having trouble meeting their needs, paying their bills, they may be eligible for that. There's dollar for dollar offsets. But if you're under the age of 65 and a doctor tells you that you're not able to work, then you're considered permanently and totally disabled, you can qualify for pension as well. Super important stuff. Yes, you're waving your hand. <laughs> Did you have to be in war or just be serving while wartime? Well, regarding pension, it's one day during wartime period. You don't have to be in the war. You have to have served one day during that. Uh, so there's, there's benefits there. Healthcare enrollment. A show of hands of those guys that were vets. How many have your VA ID card? Okay, a few of you. You're eligible for this. Terrible. I encourage you. There's eight categories, one through eight. One is the highest for service-connected vets, we were just talking about. You're going to be automatically enrolled, all the way down to eight, which is income-based. You know, there's a means test you go through, and there's a threshold. Well, that door opens and closes all the time, depending on how much staff they have and resources. If you haven't done so, I encourage you to hop into the nearest VA clinic. From us, it's Viera. Everybody know where that's at. It's a 1010 EZ, and it actually is easy. It's a one page form. You take your DD 214 in there, you give it to them. They make the determination, hopefully on the spot, and you'll end up with a VA ID card that has your photo on it. And that's good wherever you might travel in the United States. It's also a foreign medical plan. If you decide that you want to go live in Costa Rica and you have service connected disabilities, they'll provide care at no cost to you through this FMP just by virtue of your honorable service over there. So are you getting, yes? About five minutes. Okay, very good, I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up. There's a couple, <laughs> couple other things I wanna mention. You got an idea that there's benefits out there, right? There's some benefits manuals. There's the state benefit manual over here. Now let me get to some good stuff. Let's say that you're a veteran and you're having trouble paying your bills. I'm a deputy director with the Florida Veterans Foundation. This is the nonprofit arm of the Florida Department of Veterans Affairs. We have an emergency assistance grant program where if you are, again, meet the criteria, you shoot me an email, I'll send the application to you, or you know somebody that's in that category. Tell them about it. Shoot me an email, they get the application, they submit their bills, doesn't pay to the veteran, it pays to the creditors, anywhere from $500 to $1,100. It's a well-funded program, so take advantage of it. That's the FBF, should be some cards up here about that also. Um, 
I got the word out about our American Warrior Radio every Saturday, 11 to noon, on AM 1300 WMEL. Let me cover a couple other things real quick. First, I have to mention the care packages. we got to send them out. we got 275 of them we packed out at Northrop Grumman. The uh, Can You See Me Now Motorcycle Safety Awareness Ride is coming up on May 20th. It's during Armed Forces Week. That's why ABET Project's involved. I'm an ABET member, avid motorcyclist. Encourage everybody to just join. We want to get as many motorcycles on the road to increase awareness about safety there. And uh, I'll get to something really cool in a minute, but this is pretty cool. MMA, Donnie here, uh, mixed martial arts. They're doing a benefit May 26th at Levels Nightclub across from Sam's Club. Pretty inexpensive, really, to attend. It's an all-day affair. It's family-friendly, May 26th. You can check that out. Hey, who doesn't like something that's free, right? Who likes baseball? Show of hands. Come on, come on. Okay, free opportunity to go to the Manatees ball game, all right? If you're a veteran or active duty, you will get eight seats, eight tickets by the dugout, eight beverages, eight hot dogs, on-field recognition, and a beautiful plaque made by one of our <laughs> Vietnam vets who's a volunteer, all by going and picking out a home game on the ABET Project website, send Kim an email with what game. There's still plenty available. Free! Free! Lots of fun. And uh, like I said... The cruise. This is a little more costly, but it's really kind of cool. July 21st, uh, mudslide motorcycle event. Dedicated riders. A lot of them are active duty. The leader is an active duty person. We're going to fill up that Victory Casino cruise line. Uh, for a day out, gambling, having fun. The details are here. I won't go any further than that, but it's inexpensive. It's fun, and it shows your support of the, of the troops. Like I said, there's lots of information here. Got some bookmarks. Rather than having a brochure that you read and throw away, this is something you'll keep. Describes our core programs and services, and uh, I'm about done with that. Anybody got any questions? If you do, see Glenn McGuffey. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for having me.